Robert Miller, presentation topic, The International Law, Doctrine of Discovery. You'll notice the word international is capitalized in my article, or in the title of my talk. So what I am going to focus on today is the international application of the Doctrine of Discovery. Now we heard Walter Echohawk talk a bit about uh, Johnson v. McIntosh, and that's an American Supreme Court case. And so you might, well, that didn't work. Why do Canadians and Australians and Sami people and African nations, why do they care about Johnson v. McIntosh? Well, I'll tell you, and we'll talk about this briefly, and as Walter already showed, Johnson v. McIntosh is probably the primary case in the world on the doctrine of discovery. Johnson v. McIntosh has been cited by your federal courts probably at least 30 or more times, starting long ago and up nearly to the modern day. Australian federal courts have cited Johnson v. McIntosh at least 18 times from long ago to modern times. The New Zealand Supreme Court cited Johnson v. McIntosh. As you can see, it's an 1823 case. The New Zealand Supreme Court cited Johnson v. McIntosh in 1847. The Privy Council. Now, I know nothing about, I'm going to say, the, give the day, same disclaimer that Walter gave. I know almost nothing about Canadian history and Canadian law, so that's why I'm going to focus on the international aspect and U.S. law. But the Privy Council, which I believe used to be the Commonwealth's highest court, has cited Johnson v. McIntosh three times, primarily about Africa in two cases in the 1880s, and I believe one of those three citations was about India and English claims to rights over the indigenous peoples in both Africa and India. So Johnson v. McIntosh, my gosh, it has crossed all four of these legal regimes and has been the defining case about the doctrine of discovery. So please don't think that I'm being American-centric, United States-centric when we're going to talk about this case, but it's been that important. And you'll see I'm going to only describe the case a little bit because other people are going to talk about it at great length. Johnson v. McIntosh itself relied on international law. In the United States, we're having a debate currently whether the United States should pay any attention to the law of other countries. Talk about ethnocentrism. It's unbelievable. The judge that uh, you mentioned that I used to clerk for, he's literally testified to Congress that the United States has nothing to learn from other countries and should not cite in the law of foreign countries. Ooh, I'm embarrassed to hear that he said that. But what's interesting is he must not know Johnson v. McIntosh. I guess it's my job to make my ex-judge, or the guy I used to work for, understand that the United States Supreme Court relied on international law completely and extensively in deciding the Johnson v. McIntosh case. So as Walter mentioned, Johnson v. McIntosh is a case, no tribes involved, no Indians involved, but it is the first United States Supreme Court case that significantly addresses Indian law issues. And it's pretty much a simple question. So you have two non-Indians, Johnson, who's inherited shares from his grandfather in a company that apparently, allegedly bought land from tribal leaders in the woods of what's now Illinois and Indiana in 1773. There was no United States in 1773. So while it took this case 50 years to make it to the United States Supreme Court, it is completely about what English law was in North America on the rights of indigenous peoples. So this is again why the Privy Council has cited this case and why the Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand Supreme Courts have cited it. Mackint so Johnson had inherited shares from his grandfather who had owned shares in these countries that are companies that allegedly bought land directly from tribal leaders. Mr. McIntosh, however, is living on the land, farming it, and he bought the land from the United States in 1818, who signed a treaty with these same tribes, the Illinois and Piankashaw nations, uh, in 1813. So the simple question, and the U.S. Supreme Court says this is a simple case, and the question is, what is the power of tribal peoples to sell title? What kind of title did American Indians own in their lands? And so Marshall says the simple case, and then he writes a 30-page opinion. Well, that's what us attorneys do, right? We write something called a brief that is 50 pages long. Okay, okay. Shoot me, right? Okay. 
So again, I didn't want to explain the case too much because a lot of other people are going to talk about it. But here's what the court holds. The United States was settled on this idea of discovery and conquest. Now it's interesting that the word conquest is used at all. In this 30 page opinion, it's in about five paragraphs. These tribes had not been conquered in war by the United States. The tribes at issue in the Johnson v. McIntosh case. Where did conquest come from? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. What did this do to Indian tribes? If this country was allegedly settled, and, and of course it's talking the United States, on discovery, well, tribes immediately, the court holds, lost some of their property rights to their land. Now, you, you've seen the paintings of Christopher Columbus and all these other explorers that came to the New World. What they do? Stick their flag and stick their cross in the soil. And well, that's, that's, what did that do? Well, legally, it did a lot under the international law doctrine of discovery. Now, what a joke. But when I give these talks, I always pick someone on the front row. So I'm going to come to your house tonight with the Bob Miller flag and the Bob Miller cross. Why are you laughing, sir? It's the international law doctrine of Bob Miller. And I'm going to claim her land. OK, so we laughed. What's the number for 911? Do you have a gun in your house? OK, she's going to handle it because I must be a little off my rocker to think that somehow my religion is superior to hers, my nationality is superior to her, my gender is superior to her. Well, you know I'm an American too, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> what are you guys laughing about? OK, so you get my point. It's humorous. But this is what international law was, and this is what this did to American Indian tribes and to the First Nations here. Again, I, I'm not going to say much about Canadian law, but American Indian tribes to this day own only the limited title to their land. The United States is the legal owner of Indian lands in the U.S. The tribal entity is the beneficial owner. Indian nations of the United States cannot sell, they cannot lease, they cannot develop their own land, which is 56 million acres of land in the lower 48 states. They cannot sell, lease, or develop their land without the permission and a signature from the Secretary of Interior. Now, I am certain that it's the same here in Canada. I don't know who has to sign off, your DIA or something, but the reserves here, the lands owned by your First Nations, are impacted by that identical idea. What else? Well, uh, okay. And what else did Johnson v. McIntosh do? Well, the United States Supreme Court held that it immediately limited their sovereign rights, their governance power. Their property rights, we already see, were limited, but their diplomatic and commercial rights were limited also. Because under the doctrine of discovery, a discovering European country demanded that indigenous peoples not engage in diplomacy or trade with anyone other than themselves. So they were interested in acquiring, of course, the assets of native peoples. They were interested in acquiring their lands. This was a convenient, just like me coming to your house, a convenient principle for me to get your stuff. Crazy. Okay, now that's about all I want to say about Johnson E. McIntosh now. <clears throat> but I do want to break this doctrine of discovery down into what I define as the ten elements of the doctrine of discovery. As a law professor, some of you are law students, uh, in the law, we define torts. You know, if I crash my renter car into your car out here in the parking lot, you want to sue me for negligence. There are certain elements, three or four or five things you will have to establish in court to prove I was negligent. If I commit a crime here, the Crown will have to establish the four or five elements that make up prosecuting that crime. So as a law professor, after reading Johnson v. McIntosh a hundred times, studying it, uh, I came up with these ten elements that make up the doctrine of discovery. And I want to go through these pretty quickly with you, and then we're going to go back, and one by one we're going to look at the international application of these ten elements by nine specific countries that I've studied and written about so far. England, Spain, and Portugal, <coughs> and then their settler uh, colonies, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Chile, and Brazil. I am currently right now researching the doctrine of discovery in Africa, so I will mention Africa a few times. I've only 
spent the last like three or four months reading on that. I'm trying to get a Kenyan uh, gentleman to be my co-author, and he emailed me last night and said he'll join me. So thank goodness I don't have to try to learn everything there is to know about Kenya, but I'm focusing on Kenya and Tanzania because that's where England colonized Kenya and Germany colonized Tanzania. So I want to compare, did they use these 10 elements? And I was going to say something. Oh, and I'm also going to write about the Sami people in Scandinavia. Uh, I've begun a tiny bit of research on them, read a few Norwegian uh, Supreme Court cases about the Sami and their rights. So I'll mention them very briefly too. But this is primarily talking about the nine countries that I've looked at pretty closely and I've had co-authors, uh, always tried to get a co-author from the country I'm looking at uh, to avoid being you know, an outsider of making great proclamations. So what are the ten elements? And, and this is, these are my opinion. First, obviously it's about first discovery. The European country that showed up with the flag and the cross first claimed preeminent rights, claimed these international law rights we're going to talk about. So we'll come back to this and see how those nine countries I named, if they used this, how they used this idea, this claim. Secondly, uh, Elizabeth I, your ex-queen, I guess, 1587, she adds to the doctrine of discovery and she tells Spain and Portugal, just because you find something first doesn't mean we're going to respect that you own it forever. And this is what she and her lawyers developed. If Spain and Portugal is not, are not in actual occupancy of these indigenous lands when the English show up, the English will claim it. So it's interesting to me that Elizabeth I complied with this international law at all, which we'll see in a moment came a lot from the Pope and papal bulls, because Elizabeth was already excommunicated and she wasn't a Catholic. But she did recognize that this doctrine of discovery was emerging international law. What's international law, folks? Well, very simple. It's the rules and principles that governments follow in their interactions with each other. So this was, Kelly, I already have water. I'm going to step ahead of you. Okay. Thank you very much. If I get, keep that close if I get real thirsty. Um, I was talking about, <laughs> okay, well, something, so we'll stop there. We'll be back to that later. What, now I, I run out of room on the slides, so I had to put two together. What did Europeans actually claim? Some cases erroneously claim that under the doctrine of discovery that the Europeans claimed immediate fee simple title ownership of the land. There is def definition of that, and we'll define native title, title in a moment. But mostly what is meant by European title is what's called the right of preemption. European countries, and especially then the United States and then here Canada, to my knowledge, claimed the sole right, the only right, to buy the land from the indigenous peoples if and when they ever chose to sell. This word preemption was used by the first United States Congress in 1790 in one of the first laws about Indian nations that the United States Congress enacted. So what we're trying, so the Europeans had sort of a future interest. That's purely what it is. It's a future interest in the lands if the tribes ever died out, abandoned their lands, or agreed to sell. But they could only sell to one buyer. You all, what happens when there's only one buyer of your product? Price fixing. Well, they call that a monopsony. I'm sure you all know what a monopoly is. But a monopsony is when there can only be one buyer. A monopoly is when there's only one seller. So the price is in the toilet, to use a legal phrase. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being taped on. I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, I'm also taking my coat off because I'm getting too warm. I get excited when I start to talk about this stuff. I've been working on it for 10 years or more. And anyway, what were tribes left with? Well, something that's called native title in the United States cases is called Indian title. What did the tribes have? Well, they actually have a very valuable property right still, folks, even after Europeans claimed and, show, and claimed this ultimate control. The tribes have the right to occupy and use their lands. What's the primary value of real estate? It's to live on it and use it, farm it or mine it or whatever. So that's still a very valuable right, but it's a limited one. It's not the fee simple title that our Anglo-American law defines as the full ownership of real estate. What else happened to tribes? Well, and what I'm telling you folks, now the, the, the Johnson v. McIntosh doesn't lay these ten elements out 
like I say, I've read the case so many times. These are the ten factors that I divine from the language of the opinion as to what the doctrine of discovery actually is. Tribes, we've already mentioned, limited sovereign, limited commercial rights after being discovered. And I think Walter mentioned that this morning. Who was always lost? It was the Europeans who were always lost. But they pretended they discovered us. Okay. Contiguity. I need to go ahead real fast, and this could be a mistake. Contiguity is how big of an area a European country could claim just by showing up at one little spot on the coast and sticking their flag and cross in the soil. So I'm going to rush ahead, and this is a mistake, I'm sure. And I'm going to use the map of the United States and the growth of the United States to explain to you what contiguity is. So when the United States made the alleged purchase of the Louisiana Territory, this yellow part here, you know how we defined how big the area was? Our third president, Thomas Jefferson, spent the summer of 1804, right after the Louisiana Treaty was ratified, researching the drainage system of the Mississippi River. He traced the French explorations, uh, you know, down, what is that, the St. Lawrence River, right through the Great Lakes, creation of St. Louis, creation, what are those other cities, but most important, when did the French get to the mouth of the Mississippi River? When did they plant that flag and cross? Of course, why is it named Louisiana? It was named for King Louis the whatever, 14th or whatever. Well, look at the definition of the Oregon country. That's where you folks live and that's where I live. The Oregon country. Well, it's clear up to the tip of Washington, uh, Alaska today, the 54th degree of parallel. In fact, we had a president run for office in 1844. Have you ever heard the slogan? His campaign slogan was 5440 or fight. He was going to go to war with England over the entire Oregon country because the United States claimed under international law and the doctrine of discovery that we discovered it first, we occupied it first, and we owned it. We argued with England for 40 years. You can read letter after letter between ministers of England and secretaries of state of the United States saying, oh no, we found it first, we occupied it. Okay, so I won't belabor that. But look at that. So we all live in the Oregon country and that's defined by the drainage system of the Columbia River. Now I'm going to try to go backwards. Oh, you know what? It may be smarter to go forward. Oh, see, I've learned how to use this. So that's contiguity. How big of an area could a country claim? In the colonial charters in what's the US now, New England, Massachusetts, James I granted the colonies 100 English miles around their actual settlements. Later colonies, colonial charters from the kings of England granted Americans not only from the East Coast but all the way to the South Sea, which was the Pacific. And you all know how far away the Atlantic is from the Pacific. Boy, that's a pretty big... So when I come to your house, I'm claiming the whole neighborhood when I stick my flag and cross. Okay, terra nullius. What's uh, element number seven? It's Latin for empty earth, void. You know the phrase null and void. So terra is land, n void land. Europeans claim... Now, there are two definitions for this, and I want you to notice that. If lands were really empty... Of course they claimed it, and, then, and they claimed the whole ownership of it, not just the preemption European title, number three. But they gave a second definition to this. If the native peoples who lived there did not have a government and did not have laws that looked like the European ones, and guess what, we didn't, right? Because we had a different legal regime. They considered it terra nullius, and they could occupy it. I'll, I'll talk about this when we get around to it, but terra nullius is the argument that was used in Australia and for the Aboriginal people's rights to be completely ignored. It took until 1992 for the uh, Australian Supreme Court in the Mabo case to say, gosh, that was a lie back in 1770 and in 1788, and it's a lie today, and we can't allow a lie to be part of our legal system. And they reversed the idea of Mabo. So when you heard Walter Echohawk talking about could we reverse Johnson v. McIntosh someday, the Mabo case gives me great uh, hope for perhaps that prospect. Now, I ran out of room on the slides, so these next three elements are all on the same one. 
Conquest, we'll talk about that. Now, there were also two definitions of conquest, folks, in Johnson v. McIntosh. One is actual physical military conquest. The law of Europe for 300 years before this had applied to when one country conquered another. Of course, all the royal lands were lost from the losing side, but private property rights were supposed to still be respected of individuals. Well, that was not used here in the U.S., but conquest and just war was part of the doctrine of discovery. Uh, this, I'll get to this later, but the Spanish literally used the word just war, put it in their requerimiento that was drafted in 1513, in which King Ferdinand required his conquistadors to read to the indigenous peoples before they attacked them and killed them. The conquistadors were so worried that the natives might actually convert and accept Spanish crown, they started what they called reading it into their beard. They'd read it at night from the ship. You know, they'd read it to the land, and some of the times the priest would read it while they were attacking the village. Okay, thanks. Now, obviously, these last two, Christianity and civilization. Why were indigenous peoples uh, denigrated and esteemed as lower than human? Because they weren't Christians and because they weren't civilized. Gee, attach that civilized to the conquest and the... Ch okay, who was civilized? I forgot to tell you the second definition of conquest. In Johnson v. McIntosh, while it talks about military and actual military conquest, it also seems to say, you have to read behind the lines to get this, that the moment Europeans showed up with their flag and cross, that was the same as if they had militarily conquered. Because why did the Europeans claim all these other rights? So anyway, two definitions of terra nullius, two definitions of conquest. So I'm going to show you the maps very quickly, and then I'm going to go through an article that I wrote here that does a comparative analysis of all the work I've done on these nine different countries. And we'll look back at those elements. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI divided the world for the Spanish and the Portuguese. Before that, the Portuguese had gotten papal bulls in 1436 about the Canary Islands and then received extensions of those papal bulls in 1452, 1453, and 1455 as they went down the west coast of Africa. At first, the Canary Island a papal bull, folks, is an edict from the church. And of course, at the time that the pope was considered practically the ruler of the world, Christ's vicar on earth, or however the title is, governments looked to the Pope. So Spain and Portugal had looked to the Pope to settle their conflicting claims over the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands, in 1436, the Pope only granted Portugal the right to control, civilize, and Christianize the Canary Island people for the Pope because of the Pope's shepherding duties over the entire earthly flock. Sort of like the trust responsibility. I don't know what you call that in Canada. Same thing? Trust responsibility, paternalism. Uh, anyway, so then Spain decides to send Columbus to the West because they're getting tired of Portugal having everything. And most people think that Columbus went to the West to look for good prices on cinnamon and stuff. Do you believe that? Was he going to fall off the edge of the earth? Well, that's another falsehood we're taught. No, he was headed, wasn't he, to India and China. And yes, in the seven documents he signed, there's some reference like in document six and seven to spices. You know what's in document number one, two, and three? Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand promise him, and I can quote this, we will make you the admiral over any land you discover and acquire for us, period, close quote. He was on an exploration of discovery. The moment he found land in the Caribbean, he races back to uh, Spain and Isabel and Ferdinand send their lawyers, the good guys in this story, remember that, don't forget I'm a lawyer, they send the good guys to the Pope. Well, now we want a papal bull. And Alexander, who just accidentally happened to be Spanish and a new Pope, he issues four papal bulls in 1493, draws that dotted line that you see there. How many of us knew that they knew about the North and South Pole in 1493? Wasn't Columbus allegedly sailing off the edge of the earth? Well, as show, I don't know who teaches us that. We've got to go talk to that person. Spain, uh, Portugal was unhappy with that line that the Pope drew. And so the very next year, 1494, on the left there, you can see they signed the Treaty of Tordesillas. And they moved that line about 500 miles to the west. 
because Portugal wanted a bit of Brazil and they wanted to protect their southern route to get to India and Ethiopia, etc. So this is known in history as the line of demarcation between Spanish and Portuguese claims to the entire world. Now they paid no attention in 1493 of where the line went through the Pacific. But of course, as the Spanish ultimately found the Pacific, Balboa crosses Panama in 1513. Now, what did he do, ma'am? He stuck his flag and his cross in the waters of the Pacific. And contiguity, he claimed the entire ocean and all the lands adjoining there too. Boy, that's a pretty big contiguity claim, isn't it? But then Portugal goes, hey, wait a minute, we own part of that. Where does that line go? So they are through the Pacific. So they argued about that for several decades, sent ships and explorers out there to shoot the sun, and, and they finally drew the line in the Treaty of Zaragoza in 1529, smack dab dividing Australia in half. In fact, when James Cook first landed in the southeast part of Australia, near Sydney, in 1770, and he does the flag and the cross, and he writes stuff, carves the king's name in trees and stuff, trying to prove his first discovery, he claimed only the eastern part of Australia because they knew about that line and the Dutch had now inherited the Portuguese claims to Asia, etc. Dutch found, a Dutchman landed in Western Australia in 1606, another one, and put up a plate that said this belongs to Holland. And, uh, okay, so I digress. How am I going to get done in just an hour? Well, I'm not. <laughs> you guys are stuck in your seat till I let you go. Class dismissed. Remember, I'm a professor. Okay, this is just another map, not near as good. Here's the better map of South America, how it was divided. We'll talk about Spain and Portugal Spain, yes, fighting about some lands in the, what they called the unoccupied lands that's now Uruguay and more of Brazil. Because there's the line of demarcation. But as you all know, Brazil goes like clear into here today. Oops. Mistake. And then we've already looked at the map of the United States. Every one of these growths, expansions of the United States, is explained by the doctrine of discovery and these international legal principles we're talking about. So this is, and this isn't just old history. I've already explained to you. We're not just talking about a funny old case, Johnson v. McIntosh. We're talking about modern day American Indian law and restrictions on tribal powers and sovereignty and trade and diplomacy. Is there ever going to be an American Indian nation with a seat at the UN? Not if the United States has a voice in it, and not if the doctrine of discoveries continue to be applied. Okay, we decided to go. So now we're back to the ten elements. I'm going to go slowly and talk about, uh, I'm going to use this article that I wrote. I brought some copies, and I've already given a few away. And for those who promise to read it, there's a copy available. Okay. First discovery. These nine nations that I've looked at, did they all use first discovery? Well, and beyond even this article, how did uh, Europeans use the doctrine of discovery and first discovery in Africa? Well, they used it immensely, as I've learned in the last three months that I've been reading it. They were run... You remember Stanley Wilkins? Or not... Uh, who is it? Stanley and Dr. Livingston, I presume. Do you all know that statement? When Stanley was working for the King of Belgium and was going around every chief he could find, he was signing treaties with these chiefs. And Livingston, or Wilkin, Livingston was down there doing the same thing. He started out as a missionary, but he sort of ended up being an agent for England. They were running around Africa looking for any chief who would sign a treaty with them, and then they would show it to other Europeans going, we were here first, you have to go somewhere else. There were literally hundreds and hundreds of treaties signed by France, England, Germany, Spain, Italy, and Belgium in uh, Africa. Okay, but now to the countries that I looked at, Spain, Portugal, England were the primary colonizing countries. They, of course, used doctrine of discovery, first discovery claims. Even though the Pope divided the world in half for Spain and Portugal, they still, in fact, the Pope said at the time, well, I got ahead of myself, so I'll mention that in the next one. All of these countries used the idea of first discovery. And I primarily looked at how Spain used the doctrine in Chile 
But it was the same principle in all the rest of the New World where Spain went. So from southwest the United States, Texas, etc., to the tip of uh, the Straits of Magellan, Spain was using this idea of first discovery. I was intrigued when I started to research this because the kings of Spain passed more laws about the doctrine of discovery than I ever imagined were possible. I can't speak Spanish so I could only look at translations, but they passed more laws about this than any other country did. And Spanish kings from 1534 forward were passing laws ordering first discovery and to undertake some sort of symbolic act to prove you had been there. There became, in each different country, developed protocols of how the European country would prove a first discovery. I already told you when Captain Cook was on his first round the world voyage in 1770, he lands in Australia. He's sticking the flag and a cross in the soil, but that disappears as soon as you take that away, doesn't it? So he's painting stuff on rocks, he's carving stuff on trees, in Brazil, the Portuguese would make enormous wooden crosses. They would hold mass immediately. They would take something home to the king, most often a piece of dirt. And that is very symbolic of the feudal legal principles of how you prove the transfer of ownership. The Portuguese also, all along the west coast of Africa, uh, erected enormous stone padroas monuments that said this land is under the sovereignty of Portugal and king whoever the current king was. Those stone uh, monuments were there for hundreds of years. I think some of them are still in museums in different places. So every country uh, used first discovery. When Chile became independent of uh, Spain, they continued to do the same thing against the Mapuche people and in the Straits of Magellan. And you've probably heard of Rapa Nui, Easter Island, the dispute that's been going on there recently. Chile claims its ownership of uh, Easter Island due to first discovery in 1880, which is kind of funny because Europeans had been there before that. Uh-oh, someone owes $10. You want me to collect that for you? I'm pretty good at that. I used to be in the used car business, and I repossess cars all the time, so I can get that for you. Okay, uh, folks, the United States and Canada. Henry VII, when he chartered John Cabot to come to North America in 1496 to 1498, he ordered him, and here it is, quote, discover countries, regions, or provinces of the heathen and infidels, which before this time have been unknown to all Christians. Isn't that first discovery? Henry VII ordering John Cabot. So from Newfoundland to about modern-day Virginia, I guess cabinet row ashore every couple hundred miles, and boom, boom, we'll be back. This is ours now. Me coming to your house. Not much difference, right? Okay, well, let's not belabor that too much. I've got to keep my... The United States made first discovery claims, I already told you, to the Oregon country. While people allege the Spanish had found the mouth of the Columbia River perhaps as early as 1775, Spain never advertised it. Spain had a policy of keeping their discoveries secret. Well, that hurt them in the realm of international law. But when an American named Robert Gray found the river in May of 1792, he named the, ship, the, the river after his own ship. He was sailing in the Columbia Red Aviva, and he names the Columbia River. Uh, George Vancouver was out here at that same time and our American sea captain sails by him and goes, ha, 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 I just found a river. And he told Vancouver where it was. Well, that was maybe a mistake because Vancouver immediately sent Lieutenant William Broughton, who was in his separate ship. He and Vancouver, as you guys all know, were out here like, what, three years mapping Vancouver Island and Puget Sound, et cetera, et cetera. He sends Lieutenant William Broughton, who then goes 100 miles up the Columbia River, at a place pretty near my house. And what does Broughton do the furthest? Well, first off, he names all those mountains. And we still keep the name of a British admiral to, for the highest mountain in Oregon, Mount Hood. I don't understand that. Okay. But anyway, Broughton gets out, turns some dirt, raises the English flag, drinks a host, and claims the entire area for the King of England. First discovery. But we, the US was there first. OK, so I don't want, did in Canada, I'm going to apply as much of this as possible to Canada. And in 1670, I, I, there's not as much in New Zealand or Canada about using first discovery. 
We'll get to this later that when the English arrived in New Zealand, they immediately signed treaties with the tribes there. So they didn't so much claim first discovery. And in Canada, the only thing I and my co-authors could find was the, about first discovery was the Hudson Bay Charter. Now, don't forget, I already said that John Cabot was in Newfoundland. So he was claiming part of Canada under the direct orders of Henry VII to use first discovery. But in the Charter 1670 of the Hudson Bay Company, I guess I won't read you this, but there is definitely reference from King Charles II to find discoveries that others had not yet made. So he was definitely talking about, oh, he says, and here's quote, actually, or find lands that are not, quote, actually possessed by any of our subjects or by the subjects of any other Christian prince or state, close quote. Sounds like first discovery to me. So actual occupancy, I told you that Elizabeth I insisted on this, and it came to be part of uh, international law. In fact, those papal bulls that divided the world in half for Spain and Portugal, even while the Pope was alleging that kind of power over the world, Alexander VI said to Spain and Portugal, if another Christian country is already patient of lands in these areas I'm giving you, as of January 1st, 1493, that claim by that Europe, other European country is still good. So even Pope Alexander VI recognized the power of actual occupancy in 1493. So Spain and Portugal were well aware of, even if you say not the legal importance, what's the practical importance of actually being somewhere when another country shows up? Do you guys know that Francoise de la Palrousse sailed by uh, Australia when the first fleet and Captain Philip was there in 1788 and he was coming there to plant the French flag and Captain Philip says, hey, see us? We're already here. And we brought all these criminals and we're going to live here. So, choo, choo, go away. So, Perus goes to Alaska, folks. And in Yakutat Bay, guess what he does? Claims it all for the king of France. So, all these countries, do, but actual occupancy, if you're there, the other country will pretty much agree and leave. Uh, in North America, England claimed the actual occupancy rights. The Dutch and the Swedish, if you didn't know that, created temporary colonies in New York and Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So that's why, uh, well, gee, Manhattan was supposedly bought by the Dutch, right? Manhattan Island. And the English argued with them for 20 years. We were here first. Our colonies are here. We not only discovered it first, we've occupied it first. Now get the heck out of here. So the Swedish finally left. The Dutch had to be encouraged to leave at the point of a gun. But anyway, point of a gun makes some importance. Uh, I mentioned the Spanish laws. In 1538, Charles V of Spain passed a law about discovery and settlement of islands in the Southern Sea. So that's the entire Pacific. In Florida, Spanish explorers were ordered to occupy the land because the French were coming soon. The French and the Dutch fought with uh, Brazil, uh, fought with Portugal over Brazil. So the Portuguese kings were desperate to get Portuguese settlers there, get cities built. And in 1548, when they appointed the first Portuguese governor general to rule uh, Brazil, his primary responsibility was to strengthen existing Portuguese settlements and to expand more. They knew about occupancy. I love the symbolic acts of actual occupancy that people engaged in. I mean, what was the flag and the cross? What was Cook doing when he painted certain rocks? Gee, what was Alexander Mackenzie doing? You know that name, don't you, who crosses Canada, first alleged uh, European to have crossed North America. Of course, they always forget the Spanish Cabeza de Vaca who crossed Mexico in like 1540. But anyway, so when Mackenzie crosses North America, what does he paint when he gets to, someone told me yesterday, Bella Coola? Where's Jeanette? Is that where, you're from there? Is that where, so that's where Mackenzie, and what did he paint? Alexander Mackenzie from the East Coast or something, 1792 to 93. He then published his book about this in 1800. And this is the book that led to our, the third president, Thomas Jefferson, sending the Lewis and Clark expedition. If you ever heard of Lewis and Clark, they're our most famous explorers, and that's who my tribe appointed me to be involved with for three years during the bicentennial. And that's where my books and writing out of 
the doctrine of discovery came because I, w I wanted to study what Thomas Jefferson knew about the doctrine of discovery and what those little country bumpkin explorers, Lewis and Clark, maybe knew about it. So in books about Thomas Jefferson, he's reading Mackenzie's book and he is terrified that England and slash Canada are going to preempt the United States' manifest destiny to cross the whole continent. He immediately, he and Meriwether Lewis, Meriwether Lewis of that Lewis and Clark expedition was Thomas Jefferson's private secretary. So they're in the White House spreading Mackenzie's map. They're just praying to God he didn't find the Columbia, which he didn't, right? Isn't there a river called the Mackenzie? <laughs> okay. Anyway, actual, how'd I get off onto that? But that wasn't, that. oh, symbolic acts of possession. So what did James Cook do? He got very clever, folks. I'm researching right now his third voyage to Alaska. And I've got to read you what he was ordered by the Admiralty. So the Admiralty understood and knew first discovery and occupation and acts of... Three times James Cook went around the world, 1770, I forget the exact date of the second one, 1776, I believe, and then 1778 when he came to Alaska, and then he went to Hawaii and the islanders killed him. Go Hawaii! <laughs> Here's what he was ordered. You are also, with the consent of the natives, to take possession in the name of the King of Great Britain of convenient situations in such countries as you may discover. There's two or three of my elements right there. If there are natives there, you need their consent to occupy. Wow. And to take possession. And you obviously would be the first discoverer if you get there and there's only natives there. Uh, that ha Oh, here's first discovery. That have not already been discovered or visited by any other European power. So that's first discovery, the Admiralty's ordered him. And to distribute among the inhabitants such things as will remain as traces and testimonies of your having been there. So that's part of the purpose of leaving medallions with chiefs. Did Canada and France do that with the chiefs in Canada? Absolutely. I've seen paintings of your chiefs in museums in Toronto and stuff. They're all wearing these medallions that the Lewis and Clark expedition handed out something like a hundred of them with President Jefferson's image on it. Historians call these objects sovereignty tokens because by Europeans handing those out, they assumed if the native leaders and the native people took these objects, that they were sort of pledging allegiance to that European sovereign. This is definitely what Lewis and Clark thought it meant. Lewis and Clark handed out American flags, American military uniforms, and these Jefferson peace medals. So the next time you see a painting in a museum of one of the uh, tribal leaders from the past, I'll bet you half the time they'll be wearing one of these French, Spanish, English, or American. Okay, I digressed, didn't I? See, I need more time, I need more time. Okay, now, the Lords of the Admiralty not only gave that description to Cook that encompasses about three of my ten elements, they also told him about uh, empty lands. And so I have to jump to another page to continue that instruction. So after telling him that if it's an occupied land, take possession of it with the consent of the natives and leave things that prove you've been there. Here's how that same paragraph continues. If you find the country uninhabited, ooh, isn't that terra nullius? If you find the country uninhabited, take possession of it for his majesty by setting up proper marks and inscriptions as first discoverers and possessors. That's actual occupancy. That's symbolic occupation by leaving objects that prove you've been there. So Cook got real smart on his third voyage, folks, and he did this three times in what's today Alaska. He went ashore, they raised the flag, they drank a good porter to his majesty's health, they took a shovel and turned dirt. Remember how I told you earlier the Portuguese took some dirt back to their king and that this hearkened to a feudal uh, legal principle from probably 1200 to 1700, how you prove the transfer of real property, land, was by some sort of picking up a dirt clod and handing it to the new owner. That's how you did this in old England before there were land titles and land title offices. So now, 
Cook and his men are turning dirt, drinking the health, raising the flag. They put English coins in glass jars and they hid them. The Russians planted numerous lead plates in secret places all down the coast of what's Alaska and now British Columbia. The French in our Ohio, the United States Ohio Valley in 1749 sent a military force planting lead plates that said this area belongs to France. We're reaffirming our claim to it from like 1640 when Champlain and Joliet and all those guys did that. So they were doing what they could to try to prove where they had been. They were using symbolic acts of actual occupancy when they did not yet have the, the colonial power, the population to physically uh, occupy an area. So it's just like me coming to your house and I'll leave my calling card, I'll leave a business card on your front porch, okay? She's too busy working. She doesn't know she's going to lose her house today. She's laughing, thinking it's a joke. <laughs> I'm not joking. Okay, we're, do, how much time do I have? Okay, ten elements. Maybe I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. I already told you that preemption was used by the United States Congress in the, one of the first laws passed about American Indians, July 22, 1790. The law is still in effect today, 25 U.S.C. Section 177. American Indians and Indian tribes, bands, and nations cannot sell their land without the permission of the United States. And in the first version of that act in 1790, it used the word preemption because the United States has the right of preemption. Wow. Other countries uh, and Spain passed laws galore. I've told you about that. Chile has passed laws galore, and in their constitution to this day is this idea of preemption that the Mapuche cannot sell their land without the permission of the Republic of Chile. So these ideas are across the world. Have you gotten why I had the words in all caps in the title of my talk? International. And so even though Johnson v. McIntosh is a U.S. Supreme Court case, absolutely relevant to indigenous peoples everywhere. The Mapuche are still controlled, uh, in fact, Chile passed the laws recently as 1972 and 1979 that control Mapuche property rights. Brazilian indigenous peoples in the Constitution of 1988 cannot, they do not have the full ownership over their lands. The English Crown did the same thing. In the U.S., all 13 U.S. Colonial, uh, British colonies passed hundreds of laws controlling the sale of Indian lands and that private individuals could not buy Indian land. Now think back to Johnson v. McIntosh, what that case was about. Those private individuals tried to buy land directly from Indians. They were going against 200 years of known law. No wonder they lost Johnson v. McIntosh, because they were going against the established law. Uh, in Africa, folks, to, so again, this is just my recent research, but uh, these principles were applied, and in these treaties that I told you, there literally were hundreds of treaties signed by those seven European countries that primarily colonized Africa, and primarily from around 1870, so it's far more modern day. And of course, then in 1885, there was the Berlin Conference where the Europeans carved up Africa. Why were they doing it? Now, I've not really found evidence for all ten of the elements. They obviously were using first discovery. They were running around Africa trying to get a chief to sign something. But in these treaties, I, I wonder if the chiefs were told what the English language said, or French, or whatever. But they put themselves under the protection of the, United uh, of the uh, European that discovered them. They agreed to sign no treaty and engage in no business with any other European power. So there's two or three or four of those first seven elements applied in uh, Africa. I've not yet done enough Sami research to find much more than in the Sami cases that I've read, there's a limitation on Sami property rights because the Norwegian Supreme Court says, why well, you were uh, nomadic reindeer herders. Your rights don't even, your rights to property don't even equate to the right of a farmer and cultivator. So there's a couple of the elements I've already found as applied to the Sami. Oh, I'm looking for the clock, it's on my wrist. Um, native title, the limitation on Indian, indigenous peoples around the world, as I already said, in the, in the Chilean laws, in the Brazilian constitution, in American law, and in Canadian law, and in New Zealand law, too. 
Uh, the limited rights of government and commercial rights, uh, what I guess I would call the trust responsibility. It's what we call it in the United States. And this was applied, I've already mentioned, to the African nations because in those treaties they signed, they put themselves, they literally put their entire sovereignty. So that's if they were told what those English words meant. But they gave their entire sovereignty and put themselves under the protection of whichever one of these European countries they signed a treaty with. Almost all of the 375 treaties that the United States signed with Indian nations, one of the first phrases, and I can quote this, this nation X puts itself under the protection of the United States and of no other sovereign whatsoever, period, close quote. So this is, uh, falls into this idea that now you're not a full-fledged sovereign, number five up there. You look to the United States or you look to those European countries if you were an African nation to tell you what to do, when to do, and how to do it. And that, of course, goes along with civilization because you aren't civilized enough to handle your own affairs. Gee, you've been here 10,000 years or since time immemorial. You've survived, you're doing well, but you're not civilized. And when I was saying you, I wasn't talking to you in the room. <laughs> That's what Europeans were telling indigenous people around the world. Many of the countries, as far as limited commercial rights, engaged in what was out-and-out -out slavery, forced labor. The Spanish even had a name for it, the encomienda system, which Columbus started the moment he landed in Hispanola and the islands. It was brought to Mexico, it was brought to Chile, forced labor, laws that the kings of Spain passed that demanded 60 days of labor from every Chilean indigenous person. No pay, you had to work for the government. Brazil did the same thing and Africa was even worse. And what the hypocrisy about Africa is unbelievable because the justification for the Europeans carving up Africa in the Berlin Treaty of 1885 was to protect the indigenous peoples and to stop slavery. And then the Europeans went to Africa and enslaved the people. If you know what King Leopold did in the Congo for folks, cutting people's hands off, cutting their feet off if they didn't go collect enough rubber and stuff, it was unbelievable. But where I'm studying Kenya right now, England did the identical same thing. They didn't call it slavery. It was enforced labor 15 days a year. Well, is that not slavery? So the, the diminution of the commercial rights, and we're talking now even human rights, of course, of indigenous people were done by all these European uh, colonizers and then their settler states that resulted from that. Okay, I see I'm getting a little close. I want to make sure. Well, let's talk a little more. I'll, I'll try to focus just on the Canadian aspects. So the Royal Proclamation of 1763, that's still law in Canada, right? It was the law in the United States for only, you know, 18 years because we fought back and won our uh, independence. But do you know that the doctrine of discovery is enshrined and some of these elements are enshrined in the Royal Proclamation, still applying to indigenous peoples here in Canada today. I'll quote you the one phrase. Uh, of course, the French and Indian War, which I believe you folks call the Seven Years' War, was caused by American settlers crossing the Allegheny and Appalachian Mountains, surveying Indian lands, illegally buying Indian lands, and agitating for trouble. And so finally, the French and the tribes fought back against this British advance across the Allegheny and Appalachian Mountains close to the East Coast. The king was so mad that he had to fight this world war. Do you know that that war is really defined as the first world war? And it started in western Pennsylvania with George Washington uh, shooting some Frenchmen. So the king in 1763 writes the Royal Proclamation and he says, none of my settlers, no co British colonists can cross the Appalachian or uh, Allegheny Mountains and none of my colonists can buy Indian lands. Ah, he's exercising his power number three, the preemption authority that tribes can't sell to individuals. And here's, let me read you the part of it. So well, the king ordered that the tribes in this territory, and here's the quote, here's where I'm quoting, live under our protection, close quote. And for colonial security, it was essential that the tribes not be, quote, disturbed in the possession of such parts of our dominions and territories as, comma, not having been ceded to or purchased by us, comma, 
are reserved to them, the natives. So you almost, I guess you're going to need one of these to read this because that was a pretty long quote to follow. But there's two or three of the elements right there. So what the king is saying, you colonists can't go out there. You can't buy lands from the natives because I have the right of preemption. The land can only be sold to me. And he uses the royal we. He goes, those are my lands, although I have not yet purchased them. That's native title, that's preemption, a European title, that's number five, the limited property rights and governmental powers of tribes. I guess George III, before he went mad, knew about the doctrine of discovery, right? Okay, I'm running out of time, so let's... You're just going to have to buy this. Wait a minute, this is free, so I guess... <laughs> I'm not a very good salesman. Well, but let me tell you about this, and I do want to tell you about this because a Canadian indigenous person is my co-author. So after writing my first book about the doctrine of discovery in America, I wanted to expand it to the English colonies. And I dabbled with the idea of studying the history of these three other countries and the law of these three other countries, and I thought, I'm too old to start that. So I met Jacinta Ruru, who is a Maori professor from University of Otago. I met Larissa Barrett, who's an Aboriginal professor from Sydney. And I met Tracy Lindbergh, who I believe teaches at University of Ottawa and Athabascan University, and she's Cree. So we wrote this book, Discovering Indigenous Lands, The Doctrine of Discovering the English Colonies. Now this I'm not giving away for free. <laughs> but anyway, if you want to see more, her two chapters on Canada are actually the longest chapters in the book. So if you want to talk about the doctrine of discovery and have a comparative analysis, I obviously cite the work of all four of us a lot in this uh, short article. Okay, Let, we may have to... Terra Nullius, I've already mentioned that uh, the, the Admiralty instructed Cook to claim empty lands and that Australia was presumed to be empty. That's kind of funny, actually, because when Cook landed near at Botany Bay and tried to carve the tree, natives were throwing spears at him. But he said, it's empty. Well, the guy who was with him, Sir Joseph Banks, if you know that name, a famous naturalist and became super, super famous and super rich, he wrote... The land appears to be sparsely settled. Now, they, of course, never went any further inland than to have a spear thrown at them. So after landing at Sydney, they then went clear up by the Great Barrier Reef, and they landed at what is called today Possession Island. And they did a second one of these. Doo -doo -doo -doo, drink to the health, turn some dirt. I, I, forgot, I neglect to tell you that when Cook did that in Alaska, in Cook's Inlet, that place where he did it today is called Possession Point. There's a lot of places around the world called Possession Point because that's what the English or the other countries were trying to do under first discovery and especially the second element, trying to prove that they had already occupied the land. Do I need to say anything about Christianity, folks? We know. My gosh, these Catholic countries and then the Protestant countries. Did they really want to convert Indians even? I think it was just more justification we're better than you, and we own it. Get out of it. Die. That's what the first president of the United States really said to Indian peoples, folks, in 1783. George Washington was only a general then, and the Congress that we had at the time, we had no president at that time under the type of government we had, and we had just a one-body Congress. And they asked General Washington, this is now two years after we've won the revolution, what should we do with the tribes that mostly just fought for England? in the Revolutionary War, the American Revolutionary War. Should we tell them we've conquered them? Ooh, number eight. The Congress was asking George Washington, should we tell them we conquered them since they fought for the losing side, the British, and should we tell them they forfeited all their lands to us? That same discussion was held by the English at the end of the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War. English colonial officials started telling tribes, you have forfeited your lands to us because you fought for the French in the French and Indian War. And the tribes, I have quotes, they all go, that was between you two. That had nothing to do with us. But the English were thinking conquest in 1763. Now, 20 years later, the United States officials are thinking this element of conquest. And George Washington says, oh, we don't have to do that. We don't have to fight a war with the natives. We don't have to raise money for a standing army. We don't have to shed blood. Because he said, we will get their lands as soon as we need them. Now, this is a letter that you can read online. September 7, 1783, George Washington writes to James Duane, 
D-U-A-N-E, who was on this committee of the, of the Congress. And he uses what, the, I think people call this the Savage's Wolf Letter. So General Washington says, well, okay, we don't need to raise an army, we don't need to shed blood and fight anybody because we're going to get it when we need it. He says, what happens to the animals of the forest as we advance our frontiers? He says, why, well, they retreat, don't they? And then he says, quote, it is the same with the savage, the savage as the wolf, period, close quote. Now, I don't know if George Washington literally was de describing native peoples as animals. I'm not going to be an apologist for him, but I'm also not going to uh, ascribe the worst possible uh, intent. But what was his intent and what was American federal Indian policy for 200 years was to get all the land and all the assets of native peoples. It was not until about 1975, in the 1980s, etc., that the U.S. dawned on them that native people are still here, aren't going to disappear. Wow, now we have to deal with them. And they still do have some sovereignty. They still do have some land. They still do have some rights. They do have citizens. They have power and governance. We have to respect that. But I'll tell you, the United States had one goal, and that was to get everything. So what is the doctrine of discovery? What is law? I'm not supposed to tell any. There's a second-year law student in there I know. By now, that second-year law student is disillusioned, right? First-year law student starts school. Oh, law will change the world. What is law for? Too often, it's to justify what the majority... Well, of course, we live in countries where the majority rules, don't we? So law does what the majority want. And when native peoples in my country are 1% of the population, and I don't know what that is in Canada, I think I heard 3%. Is that... That's a pretty small uh, uh, number, isn't it? Well, anyway, I will end with that. The doctrine of discovery. What are we going to do about it? What can we do about it? I am sorry that Walter Echohawk's book won't come out until June because I've read a copy of it. I read the advance sheets. And his chapter 9 just excites me. And so I was discouraged to hear him say it won't be out until June. So maybe he'll send you a copy of the page proofs if you want them. But he talks about this strategy, this tactics to get rid of the bad parts of American Indian law. Now he's looking at America. He's talking Johnson v. McIntosh and many other cases and many other bad parts of American Indian law and he's talking about adopting the UN Declaration. So that, you know, I'm ready to get in line behind Walter and try to help him do this but we need someone in this audience to give about 20 million dollars and it's going to take 30 or 40 years just like it did for the African Americans of the US to fight against that case he was referring to. But I appreciate being here and talking with you. Thank you very much for your attention.